I'm going to try to buzz through about 25 years of work and research in 25 minutes. So it'll be kind of kind of condensed each year into a, into a minute. We'll go through it pretty quick here and try to give you uh, some idea of what we've been working on, how we got started, and maybe uh, more importantly, why we got started. I'm good. Okay. 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 Yeah, you, you can see this is a whole lot less important because I took my tie off. So. <laughs> the first thing I want people to understand is when we're talking about organic no-till or any of the organic systems we're talking about, we're really talking about modern agriculture. For those of you that are transitioning or thinking about transition to organic, uh, you know, a lot of times people say, oh, yeah, my grandfather used to be an organic farmer, I guess, because by default. Uh, what we're talking about is a whole lot different. We're really trying to put the concept of modern biology and, and modern ag engineering, <coughs> and to some extent seed breeding, behind what we're doing in um, organic no-till. And way back in 1938, uh, Clyde Laity understood when he wrote in the uh, yearbook of agriculture for the USDA that crop rotations are the secret to weed management. He said it's even more important than chemicals, biological, economic. It's the easiest thing we can do. So we discussed this last night at our meeting a little bit. And I tried to hint at it this morning. You're really going to have to rethink your operation and how you're going to fit the kinds of systems that we're going to talk about here uh, this morning into what you're doing today. It's, sometimes it requires more than a tweak or a little change. It requires complete upheaval, so be prepared to think about that. I threw some slides in here, and I'm going to go through really, really fast, from the University of Florida, not because it's organic and not because it's no-till, but just to show you the power of cover crops. This is some work that we did with Dr. David Wright at the uh, University of Florida. And he was looking at a cotton peanut rotation. I know you guys aren't cotton peanut farmers, but it's pretty much the same as corn and soybeans. It's just cotton and peanuts. And the amount of money you make or lose is pretty much the same as corn and soybeans because the cotton and peanut industry has figured that out too. It's just a commodity, and they stick it to you just like they stick it to corn and bean farmers. And so what he was doing, he was looking at this and saying, uh, uh, he's a researcher at the uh, University of Florida, and he has a 200-acre farm at home, and he has 10 children, and he said, I'd like one of them to take over the farm and be profitable. But when you look at the finances on a 200-acre farm, uh, the average income on that 200 acres in cotton peanuts at the time he did this work, averaged over five years was $5,000 a year profit. So how do we get young people interested in agriculture when you're farming 200 acres and making $5,000 profit. Is there a way you can change that? Normal way of thinking is, well, if you want $10,000, farm 400 acres. Uh, he said, no, what we're going to do is we're actually going to cut our acreage in half and farm less acres in cotton and peanuts, put more of it into cover crops, and see what that does. And just to make this real quick, at the end of the experiment, we found out that we went from $5,000 uh, profit to forty thousand dollars profit using the same land, the same resources, and then putting half, only half of it in cotton and peanuts, the other half in cover crops. Pretty amazing, because what happened is when we came out of the cover crops, this is what it looked like on the two hundred acre farm. When we came out of the cover crops, we used less water in the peanuts, so we saved money there. And look at the difference in the peanut plants coming out of the two years of the hay or grass and into peanuts. He doubled his peanut yield. So he had all the peanuts as if you were farming the full uh, acreage, but you're only farming half the acreage, which gave you time to improve the health of your soil. And this wasn't even organic. He said, if I transition to organic, I'm probably going to make $80,000 because the price of the, cotton, of the value of the cotton and peanuts is even higher. At $80,000, you can get young people interested in farming, for sure. At $5,000, you can't. Using the same resources. So again, cover crops are the key to the success of everything we do. And if, if I can encourage you to think about anything today, it's kind of getting it between your ears that you're no longer a cash grain farmer. You're a cover crop farmer. You're going to do everything you possibly can to get your cover crops growing in the right direction. And when you do that, the cash grain crops just happen to sort of like grow themselves. It's a totally different way of thinking about it, and I'm going to encourage you to think about that. Anybody here have a garden that's ever put mulch on it or knows somebody that has? And if everybody's hand doesn't go up, I'd be amazed. Why do you put mulch on a garden? To stop annual weeds from growing. 
Okay, do we all agree that works? Okay, now we already all agree that organic no-till works. If I asked you to go out and mulch a thousand acres of corn or soybeans, you would, because you're Midwesterners, you'd be polite and you'd listen to me, but in some parts of the country they'd throw things. Nobody's going to do that. You're not going to go out and mulch a thousand acres of corn or soybeans. But if you can grow the mulch right in the field at the same place at the same time that you're growing your crop, now we can do it. And that's all we're talking about. We're just trying, the rest now is tweaking. Trying to figure out how to make it work on your soil, on your farm, in your climate, with your crops, and your past crops. I'm not saying it's easy, but that's the challenge in front of us because we already agreed it works. It, we already know that it works. We know that tillage has its drawbacks. That's not my tractor, thank goodness, but it could be, you know, maybe it's one of yours. I don't think so. I hope not. And we know that once we till the soil, yes, we do open it up to erosion. And we also open it up to secondary cultivation. So what I was challenged, my, I challenged myself back in probably 1992, was how can I reduce tillage? My goal has never been to say, I'm a no-tiller and I never till the soil and I refuse to do that. I have friends that do that. Some of you may have heard of Steve Groff, a cover crop person. Steve's been out to the Midwest lots of times talking, maybe spoke to, to some of you. Uh, Steve and I agree on almost everything except Steve will say, I will never till the soil, I will spray chemicals. And I say, I will never spray chemicals, but I will till the soil. Other than that, we agree on everything. Um, so if we're talking about a different way of farming. This happens to be some work that Dr. Jeff Mitchell did at UC Davis out in California. Um, but if you can grow that much rye on your field, you have all the mulch you need for annual crops. Now what we're going to do is we're going to use uh, high-tech planters and ag engineering to get our seed in the ground through that thick mat of cover crops, and we can do that. When I talk to the folks at John Deere, they said, if you can drive a tractor through it, we can plant in it. And I think that's true. I really believe that they can. And that's what we have to work on. I wanted to show you this little video, if it works, and I hope it does. This is a friend of, just to set the stage, this is a friend of mine in Austria. He is using a roller crimper that is a poor design. Uh, it's either been sold or is for sale. Uh, and he's finds something that's a little more uh, in line with what we do. But Alfred Grand is the, the farmer here, farms about uh, 500 acres of organic grains. He's also a closet photographer, so he's done it. He has a, a drone with a camera, and so he's done some pretty cool footage here. Just to give those of you who have never seen it an idea of what we're trying to talk or think about. He's now planting soybeans with that grain drill, and he's rolling the rye. There's no sound. Uh, but you can see here he's driving along. I think you can see a little bit that the pollen is flying in front of the tractor, that dust. Uh, so the, the rye has pollinated, it's sexually mature, and he's going in there, that's him standing in the background there with flying the drone, and he's just moving along, planting soybeans, and the only thing he did after that was harvest them, certified organic beans. I just talked to him in the airport yesterday. Uh, I use airports to get a cattle on my phone calls. And Alfred said, I, I, I knew I was going to show this video. I said, how did the beans turn out? Because I saw them in the middle of the summer. They looked good. He said, I got 35 bushel of uh, beans, which I was pleased with, considering I didn't do any work. So you can see it's, it's big farm country there along the Danube River outside of Vienna. And uh, he's just moving along, planting uh, soybeans. When he first started this system, his father said he was nuts. And he also has slow motion on his camera, so you can see the roller coming through the as he's pushing the dry over. But it gives you an idea how it works and what we're trying to accomplish. And then you'll, you'll see that thick mat there, uh, nice and dense. The tractor's driving over. It looks like you're driving on wall-to-wall -wall carpeting. Uh, you're not putting a lot of pressure on the soil. And the rye is sexually mature, and he's going to come through and stick his bean seed in there. Uh, I, I tried to throw a few slides in here that show some success stories and people that are doing it. Because part of the reason you want, I mean, I could show you some failures too, uh, but that wouldn't encourage you to try it. Uh, and the more people we have trying it and the more people we have doing it, the more success we're going to have. Uh, this is a farmer from Nebraska, just sent me these pictures this past summer, and he said, I heard you give a talk, just like I'm talking to you, and he said, uh, you know how... Sometimes people, in all their honesty, give those backhanded comp compliments. He said, I thought, well, he's no smarter than I am, um, which is true. And so he went home and he tried it, and he said, by golly, it worked really well. So this was him planting 
uh, corn into hairy vets in Nebraska. Uh, trying to think of what cover crop you're going to use and how you're going to match it to the cash crop is really, really critical. So we would never plant corn into rye if we don't stick grass into the grass, and I want the nitrogen, so we plant corn into hairy vet. We'll talk a little bit, I think, about cocktail mixes maybe and planting into that. I tend to not do that. I plant. I understand the biology and the biological diversity of that is really positive. But I'm trying to time my rolling with the flowering and the sexual maturity of the cover crop. And if they flower at different times, it just makes my life even more confusing and I don't have the brain, brain, brain bandwidth for that. So I'll just kind of buzz through a couple of these pictures here. Uh, again, here he is. Uh, made a, a roller himself, similar to the one that we have designed at uh, Rodeo Institute. And again, this was 2017. He sent me the pictures this past summer. Um, there's his organic corn up out of the ground. If you can get a corn field looking that good as organic, you're pretty much guaranteed you're going to get a weed-free, or a fairly weed-free crop you know, that you can take to the bank. I don't know how many acres he did in 2017, but it was substantial. There's this corn as it's coming up, uh, again, looking quite nice. There it was uh, in the middle of summer. There he was harvesting the corn. This was at Rodeo Institute the same year. Uh, this corn field was uh, following a, um, a wheat that was planted into hairy vetch. So we did some tillage to get the hairy vetch established coming out of the wheat. We grew wheat. We harvested the wheat, we bailed the straw because we have a good strong market in the, in the east for wheat straw. And then we did some tillage, got the hairy vetch established. Again, that's where sticking small grains into the system really helps us because it gives us big windows of opportunity to get the cover crop in on time. You wouldn't expect your watermelons to do well if you planted them two months late. You can't expect your cover crop to do really well if you plant it two months late. You've got to get it in on time. If that means changing your rotation, to create windows of opportunity to get that in, that's what I'm going to encourage you to do. And you heard last night, I heard some people say, yeah, but I just like to grow corn and beans. I understand that. I don't care. <laughs> you got to have to make some changes if you want to do this. It's just nature of the beast. But this was uh, 200 bushel corn that we grew uh, in 2017. The county average for the conventional corn was 144 bushel. Our conventional corn in our research plots did 144 bushel. We were right on county average, and all our organic plots did 200 bushel. It was a strange year for weather patterns as we've been seeing all along. But again, if you can raise corn that clean with no cultivation, and I know you've had trouble here uh, in the Midwest with growing corn this way, uh, and I'm not sure exactly why, because you have a lot of uh, uh, variations. I was trying to send from Missouri uh, all the way up to Wisconsin. Uh, uh, so I have to do a farmer in Norway that's doing this now, and in Germany, growing corn this way. So there's got to be a secret. I don't know what it is, but we'll, we'll crack that code, and when we do, it'll be much easier for, for all of us. Uh, again, the, the secret to the success is really these thick, thick stands of cover crops. If you have thin, wimp, wimpy stands, it's like mulch. You know, if you send your kids out to mulch the garden, they put it on about an inch thick, it looks really pretty, and then the weeds grow through it. If you go out there and you put six inches thick, I know, because they just want to get done and go play computer games or something, or whatever it is they do. But, if you get a nice thick mat, it's going to work. And people will say, well, why does the uh, corn or the soybeans or the string beans or the you know, watermelons or whatever it is you're planting, why does that germinate and grow through the mulch but weeds don't? Keep in mind, we're trying to work with biology here. Weed seeds are very tiny, and they have the ability to lay in the soil up to 20 years before they germinate. They're very opportunistic. If that wasn't the case, they'd all germinate in the first year and that'd be nifty for us and we'd be done with it. But they last for years and years and years. Soybeans don't do that. Nobody ever plants a field of soybeans. They don't germinate and go, oh, I'll just wait a few years, they'll be back. It doesn't happen. They're large seeded, they have a lot of energy, and they're annual. They're going to do one of two things. They're going to try to germinate and grow, or they're going to rot. That's all they can do. And for the mo in most cases, they're going to try to germinate and grow, and we're going to take advantage of that. The small weed seeds are just going to lay there dormant, they didn't disappear, they didn't kill anything, they're just not expressing themselves, and the, uh, the cash crops will because they're large seeded. How heavy do we plant vets? I'm planting vets right now at about 30 pounds per acre. I'm planting my rye at three bushels. 
so it's like a hundred and eighty pounds or something like that. We tried four bushels, it didn't help. If I plant a bushel and a half, I don't sleep well at night. So I, you know, we're we're not saying it's the cheapest system you can possibly do in the world, but I think at the end of the day, we make more money with these systems. Our data supports that uh, because we're reducing operations across the field. And anytime, I think I have a slide in here, anytime you can cut seven trips out of the field, you should be making money. The trick is this, the, the tool that we designed has really made a difference. We tried, uh, I, I think we'll talk a little bit this afternoon about mowers and different tools. We tried mowers. I tried off the shelf or call the packers. We tried everything we could think of, and none of it really worked. It's like, you know, if you use a spoon to cut a steak, yeah, you'll eventually get through it, but it's not the best tool for the job. You know, we want to create a tool that really did what we wanted it to do. I also wanted to create a tool that I could put on the front of the tractor. You don't bale hay by driving over and putting the mower behind you, you know, you mow off to the side. I wanted the first tool to touch the cover crop to be the crimper not the rubber tires of the tractor. Rubber tires of the tractor can be a good crimping tool, but they are not necessarily a good crimping tool. Depends on the condition of the soil. And, and this is this is just biology and physics. It is not magic. It is not voodoo. It's nothing special. What we're doing is we're taking the soil, we're creating that, or labeling that as an anvil. We're taking the roller, that's a hammer, and we're pinching the cover crop between the anvil and the hammer, and we're squashing the stem. We lay it over, pinch the stem. When it's sexually mature, it will not stand up and grow. Roll it when it's in the green vegetative state, it's going to stand back up and laugh at you because it hasn't reproduced. And it's going to do its very best to reproduce. So we created this roller. Uh, the mowers didn't, mowers worked, but you know, they would kill it. But two things happened. One, almost every mower does some sort of gathering. Uh, even if it just creates little skips with a mulching mower, like a flail mower, in between it, there's little spots where there's no cover crop, well, that's where the weeds grow. Uh, they're going to be there and they're going to grow. Uh, some mowers do a little bit of dragging or gathering, you know, like a bush hog or something, and that didn't work very well. Sickle bar mowers can work. Uh, we weren't really happy with that. I wanted something that I could put on the front of the tractor and just go in there and print those stems. Uh, so we designed this tool. You'll notice that it's got a chevron pattern to the uh, blades. There's a reason for that. The one I showed you in Austria did not, and it bounces. If those blades were running straight, and I'm not an ag engineer, but if they were running straight across, uh, it would bounce. You put that on the front of the tractor, it's going to be miserable. Put it on the back of the tractor, you don't feel it so much. Or put your nephew on it, you don't feel it at all. Um, whatever you want. And so I was trying to figure out how do I put this, how do I make a, a roller that doesn't bounce? And uh, I've told this story many times, you may have heard it. I was watching my wife roll out pasta to make noodles. And she had a rolling pin that was spiral shaped. And it didn't bounce across the cutting board. It just rolled real smooth. And the noodles were on an angle, which is perfectly fine because it was still a long rectangular thing. And she made her noodles. And I'm thinking, ah, oh, perfect. That's what I need to do is just grab the ends of that roller and sort of in your brain sort of twist it and make a spiral. Now there's part of the blade touching the ground at any one point in time that's continuous. And it's nice and smooth. The problem is you really created a screw. And if you're screwing yourself, you climb on hills. My son always says, uh, you know, uh, climbing on flat land must be boring because <laughs> you don't have to have your foot on the combine door to keep yourself in the seat when you're sitting on the side of the hill. Um, you know, if, you, if you're screwing the tractor uphill, it works pretty well. But if you're screwing yourself downhill, you know, it's like plowing snow. When the snow gets heavier than the tractor, it's just the tractor goes, not the snow. Well, that's what was happening. So I was, we were literally standing next to a new, an old New Holland uh, hay vine with rubber crimper rollers. And my neighbor said, well, why don't you do it like that? And I said, like what? He goes, well, like that. And he pointed to the rollers. So this is the exact same spiral as a New Holland uh, hay, hay vine with crimping, rubber crimping rollers. Is it perfect? I don't know. Seems to work pretty well. Uh, and what we've done then by, by doing that, it we basically made it neutral. It pulls it uphill and downhill at the same thing. And it's easy to drive and easy to roll. The other thing we did was, in terms of the design, is we leaned the billets back. Uh, they're not mounted 90 degrees to the cylinder. All of this makes building it uh, miserable and hard because you're bending steel, uh, not uh, pasta dough. But uh, by doing that, when you don't have any ripping and tearing action of the roller as it leaves the surface of the soil, or the blade leaves the surface of the soil. 
So think about it, the blade's leaving on an angle, it just sort of lifts off the surface. If it's straight, it sort of kicks. If you watch the cleats on a bulldozer when they come around the final drive, they actually, the dust flies and they're tearing, tearing dirt. Uh, that, and that was our Mennonite neighbor that used the steel wheels on tractors. They said if you mount the cleats slightly to the back, you don't rip up hay fields. Perfect. We didn't want to tear the cover crop up. We just want to crimp it and leave it in place. By crimping it and leaving it in place as opposed to mowing it, uh, it's easy to drive a planter through it. If you mow it first and then try to plant into it, your planter turns into a hay rake. You might still say, you know, maximum root planter, but it's a hay rake. And I have spent many, many hours with a screwdriver and a utility knife cursing and cutting crap out of planters, uh, and that's not fun. Um, I tell people, and I don't have this problem, but the only reason you know you have hair can comb it is because it's attached to your head. If it was laying up there loosely, you know, it wouldn't work very well. So, you know, I could do that. So, uh, you know, our, our cylinder is a 16-inch piece of steel casing with four-inch blades on it. And people say, how'd you come up with that? And it's like, well, I went to the scrap yard. They have 16-inch well casing and four-inch plate steel. And it seemed to work. And, and so that's what we build it. And then, you know, that's what, what we do. Here's the slide I wanted to show you. The, uh, if you're paying attention to me, the image on the, on the left, the field on the left, It says uh, plow till. Uh, it was alfalfa. Because it's alfalfa and we were organic, I didn't have any good way to kill that alfalfa, so we actually mobile plowed it. We plowed it, we disked it, we packed it, and then we planted it. We waited two weeks on the, later on the other side. The other side of the field was hairy vest. This wasn't a research experiment. It was just happened to be uh, two side-by-side -side plots. And we went through there. That was hairy vest. We rolled it and printed it. I had a roller on the front, planter on the back. <coughs> Excuse me. And we came back and harvested it. Over where we plowed it, I rotary hoed it twice and cultivated it twice, and then came back to harvest it. So I had nine trips over the field. We got 143 bushels of corn. And where I did less work, you can see there's less weeds, the corn looks better. Uh, I had 160 bushels. I showed that same slide to a group, of, it was a smaller group than this, but they were economists from Penn State University. And one guy said, Yeah, but then you proved you made more money. I said, no, I didn't collect data on the economics, but any farmer in the world knows that if you can save seven trips over the field and get more corn with less work, you're going to make more money. Uh, this is kind of a picture of what it looks like. I'm showing you some corn, but I know you're going to focus on soybeans a little bit. Uh, we talked on the phone before we had this, this meeting, so we, we have a rough idea what we're going to talk about. Uh, so I wanted to focus on corn because I know you're having trouble with corn and I want to inspire you to keep thinking about it and keep working towards that. Here you can see hairy vets. And what I want to show you in this picture is there's almost as much purple as green. If you come in and roll it too early, it's going to grow back. And then you're going to be cursing at me and at the field and the planter and everything else. You can come through. The nice thing about these systems is, especially with corn, you can come through and re-roll it later and roll over it a second time because you're not going to kill the corn by, as long as you don't drive on it with the tractor tires, sit on the, on the in between the rows, you should be just fine. You can roll it a second time. But then the picture looking out over the hood of the tractor just gives the idea of what it's like to plant organic corn in these systems. It's, it's pretty cool. I mean, it really looks like fun as it is. Um, this is some corn that we had at the Institute, again, just looking at it. The challenge, the big challenge is with the planter. Well, two challenges. One is getting the right cover crop at the right place at the right time, getting the timing right, and then you got to make sure that the planter is getting a seed in the ground. You are planting into an adverse situation, and if you don't adjust your planter and get it set right and get the seed in the ground, stuff's not going to work. And you can see here where there's some seeds laying on the surface. Uh, if those seeds are laying there, they're not going to germinate and grow. So we, I've seen it in the system where it, you know, we were doing some work with Cornell University and Penn State on on farm research. Very nice guy, a gentleman in New York State. I won't use his name, but we got to the farm and we started to plant, and the seed wasn't getting in the ground. And I said, "You're gonna have to tighten up the down pressure on the press wheels, you know, to try to get that seed in the ground." And he said, "What springs?" I said, "The springs on the back of the planter for the press wheels." Oh, he said, "They rusted off years ago." I said, "Well, then it's not a no-till planter." He said, "Yes, it is. It says right on the side, no-till planter." He was a nice guy. We didn't want to beat him up too bad, but we had to go to the neighbor's planter and then try to plant it. Uh, you've got to get the seed in the ground. Sometimes that requires some additional tools on a tractor. Now, I'm not a big fan of residue managers, 
but I have found a use for the getter residue slicers or residue managers on uh, on rye for soybeans, and especially if I if I have a little bit of vetch in there, uh, it can get quite thick. We tend to tell people you need to have a minimum of 5,000 pounds of dry matter. Uh, the, the more experience you get, you'll be able to almost do that with your naked eye, what it is. But if you don't think there's enough biomass there to smother the weeds, there isn't. Uh, if it's hard to drive through and a lot of material, there is. Uh, but sometimes it makes getting seed in the ground a little tough, so you've got to deal with that on the planter. The other thing that's made a huge difference with our planter is the uh, Peckway Residue Slicers, made by a small company in Pennsylvania. Uh, the idea be behind this is that if, you, uh, if you're trying to slice through the, the rye or vets or any cover crop that you're using, buckwheat, you know, things and clover, or peas, I don't know what you're using, if, if your coulter isn't sharp and you don't have good pressure holding the cover crop in place with the planter and the coulter comes through, all it does is it just folds it and stuffs it into the ground. We call it hair pinning because it just stuffs it in the ground and lays the seed right on top of the cover crop. That's not going to germinate and grow. And if you go out there, it looks like it's sliced because you see it folded and stuffed in, but if you pull it, it pops out in one piece and you didn't do a very good job. You can have the sharpest pocket knife through here on an airplane so I don't have a pocket knife, but if you have a pocket knife, I hold up a piece of paper and you try to cut it, it's not going to cut it. If I hold both sides of the paper, you can slice right through it with almost anything. So this residue slicer is designed to use those two wheels, pin the cover crop to the ground, have the pizza cutter disc come right through the middle, slice it right through it, and uh, USDA uses those, to the Mercy uses those, uh, uh, a lot of folks are using them, and Chris Reber uses them. Uh, and it really, do you use them? No, we have With that, but like um, it had to do with the setup of the, the planter and the um, it's it's so like Jeff said. I mean that really is critical to evaluate the planter and make sure that your where pressure is being put on, you're putting it so that you're stretching out the cover crop, or else hair pinning is going to be inevitable. And that's been one of our biggest challenges with getting this work and the seed in the ground, which is even more important with corn than with with soybean. Um, but definitely evaluate the planter to be able to make sure, if, even if you don't have these residue slicers on there, that you're, um, you're, you're putting pressure on in a way that you're going to be able to get the slicing versus the hair pinning. Yeah, we're not, we're not doing any zone tillage. We're just picking it in the ground. And so you're asking a lot of your planter, and you have to set it up to do that. So this is kind of what our planter looks like now. We have a question, Jeff. Yeah. I'm sorry. Okay, I think the question is, do we plant, if I'm planting rye and I plant in this direction, do I plant my soybeans this way or the same way I planted the rye? Is that your question? Um, we farm on hills. We can only farm one way, so I can't do that across. So uh, it's a good question. What we tend to do now is when I plant my rye, I drill half of it and I broadcast half of it. I do it at the same time in the same operation. So that when I come through there, because I can, for the most part, only drive in one direction, it's nice if you can drive the other direction. It's like if I fold this down, it looks like this. If I fold it this way, it covers up that seven and a half inch gap. It makes, again, that's just geometry, I guess you call it. Um, but if I broadcast it, I have, I fill in all those spaces. I, I would always want to go in a slightly different direction. It doesn't have to be 90 degrees, but if you're off by at least 15, 20 degrees, That'll make up the difference. Now, that's when you need this yeah. equipment. Yeah, you're gonna have, yeah. Because instead of laying it down and sliding through it, you're trying to cut it. And that's when you need a good planter to cut it. Because even even on our fields, you know, I come through and I plant with a grain drill, and a lot of times we'll, we use intern labor to do some of those jobs so you don't have to drive perfectly straight. Uh, and then you come through with a planter where you are trying to drive more perfectly straight. Inevitably, things get tangled up and you have to slice through it. So that's where those Peckway slicers really slice through it. And we were always doing it perpendicularly, but similarly, the more farmers I talk with, um, more people are doing it, and this is where there's definitely a benefit of having large, square, flat fields. They're doing it at an angle, and I'm, so they're not like maybe at a 45 or somewhat an angle. So not a perfect 90 degree perpendicular, but an angle, and they're having better luck that way. Yeah, but you still have to cut through it. And with hairy vets, it's a tunnel winding mess. You've got to slice through it. Pardon me? We're on 30-inch rows. 
Oh, uh, planting speed is whatever you whatever you want to plant that. The roller has not doesn't affect it at all. It just rolls along. So if you plant at four miles an hour, plant at four miles an hour. If you plant at three, plant at three. If you plant at six, plant at six. Depends if it's going to rain or not, right? Mm -hmm. Controls the planted speed. Uh, the question is, uh, we drill part of it and broadcast part of it. Why don't we just broadcast the whole thing? Uh, because when I drill it, I'm getting something in the ground I get a much better stand. Again, I'm a cover crop farmer. I want to do the very best I can. I don't want to feed pigeons. Uh, they're going to get some of it, but you know, I find that mixture to be pretty good. Um, the stuff I drill is going to germinate a lot better than the stuff I just broadcast on the surface. Again, I'm, I'm asking a lot of this cover crop. It's my herbicide. It's my tillage. It's everything. And so it has to work. Yeah, I think we're going to, I don't want to take up too much time, but I know you're going to jump in here. Um, what, what is the variety of hairy vests that we prefer? Boy, that's a tough question. The biggest problem we have in cover crops, in my opinion, is that we have done zero breeding on cover crops in the last hundred years, probably thousand years. So we're dealing with off-the-shelf material that we just are picking, choosing, poking, and hoping. Uh, we really need to get to the point now when we start saying to breeders that cover crops are the most important crop I grow on a farm, and being such, you need to breed to the specifications and the criteria that I need on my farm or that all of you need on your farm. So like for hairy vets, for example, we were talking then about this last night, well, I would really like to see us have a sterile hybrid. Then it wouldn't matter when it flowers. What do you care? If it, I mean, it's never going to become a weed because the hotter it gets, the less it does. So as the corn grows up, it's going to senesce and disappear, uh, and it'll never go to seed. Perfect. We could do that. We have sterile hybrids and other things. It would probably take four years of plant breeding by somebody that was ingenious uh, enough to do it. Uh, but people say, oh, well, I, can you guarantee me farmers will buy it when it's there? It's like, well, I'm not ready to place orders, but uh, I think they would. But I think they would doesn't mean people go off on jobs to do breeding. And so we're stuck with this off-the-shelf stuff with variety not stated. And variety not stated in was grown in Wisconsin is different than something grown in North Dakota. And they react and they respond differently. I can buy variety not stated seed from, I saw Albert Lee here, or a bunch of different seed places, plant them in the ground. They look completely different. The leaves are a different color. The flowers are different. The morphology of the plant is different. And it's all just hairy vets. So it's a tough thing to think for a mic. Okay, what's, your t what's the best plan to plant that hairy vetch? We tell everybody about, about, about three weeks before your frost. When's that? Mm -hmm. I don't know. So for us, we're trying to plant like the third week of August, first week of September. You know, I've had farmers call me. I had a farmer call me a while ago from Iowa. Uh, I think it was actually a year and a couple months ago. Called me on December 7th and said, I didn't get my hairy vetch in yet. Do you think it's too late? I'm sure he was a good guy and a good farmer. But he said, here's my plan. What I want to do is I want to plant the hairy vetch, have it come up, then I want to graze it, then I want it to come back, then I'd like to get a cutting to bale, and then I'd like to have it grow back so I can roll it and it and suppress all the weeds in my farm. You think I'm asking too much. I said, well, I, I never tell anybody what to do. I don't, I don't even tell my wife what to do, God forbid. Uh, so I wouldn't tell him what to do, but I think he's destined for failure. You're asking too much. Uh, especially planting it on December 7th. I mean, give me a break. So if you planted your corn three months late, what kind of yield did you get? You really have to think about that. Or your soybeans. Again, good match at good mulches. We can make the finances work. Um, I'm just going to jump through this. I, I wanted to show you these pictures, and I'll turn it over to Aaron. These are some soybean trials that we did way back in 2012, and we still haven't solved the, the riddle of the problem. And we did these pro this project in Pennsylvania, in Maryland, in North Carolina with Stephen and, and Chris. And so we, we had 13 treatments in this experiment. And one of the, the two, a lot of the treatments had to do with rolling and crimping and, and the timing of that. This is a timing uh, experiment. And then, and we heard this last night, some farmers have said to us, well, if I have all that rye in the field, there's a value in that rye seed. What if I harvested it 
a bale of straw and sold that, and then no tilled into that stubble because the FRI is pretty clean. And so we added that treatment in the experiment. And what happened when we baled it and took it off, you know, the field was pretty clean. We planted the soybeans, they grew, germinated, and started the weeds. And how the combine found 17 bushels in that weedy mess, I don't know, but it did. Uh, it, it was a nightmare. And treatment 14 has nothing to do with it. But these next two treatments are something I want you to think about because this is really interesting. Happened to be treatment number 11, doesn't mean anything. It was planted on June 1st. You can see that stand awry. We rolled it. We had a decent stand of soybeans. They still got some foxtail in them, but we had 38 bushels of beans. 40 was our target yield that year. We came close. That was on June 1st. When I did the same treatment on May 23rd, seven days earlier, I had 59 bushels of beans and not a single weed in the field. What happened when I waited one week to get those beans in the ground? Somebody told me, oh, it's phases of the moon, and I don't know. I don't follow that. I don't know what, maybe they're right, maybe they're wrong. I don't know what happened. And it happened in Pennsylvania, it happened in Maryland, and it happened in North Carolina. Those beans are spotless. If I would have challenged you, and those, those were replicated randomized fields, so there was uh, four replicates. If I'd have asked you to take a wheelbarrow in those, and there were big plots to go through there and find a weed, in those, all four of those plots, you would have been hard-pressed to do it. I could have paid you a dollar a week and you'd been out there searching and you wouldn't have found anything. Why? I waited a week and did it, and this is what happened. The planter was set up exactly the same. We didn't change anything. The why was exactly the same. This is in the same field. We don't have all the answers, is my point. Uh, but we can have some really great success. Those are the Yetter... Uh, these are the shark teeth resident managers that we had in there. They were, they were on and they were set just so they were touching the mulch to give it. We had so much residue there, we had to move it a little bit to get the seed in the ground. The planter just wasn't getting the ground. So I, I can adjust those. I dropped them just so they were moving some of it and gave me a chance to get in there. I don't want to take too many questions. I'm going to let Aaron jump in here now and I'll get out of this.